The Amiga from Commodore is one of the most versatile computers currently available with applications far beyond a mere games machine, right up to professional standard in graphics, image processing, desktop publishing and video. In this video we give you a glimpse of some of the applications, software and hardware in most common use. You will see that the Amiga is a versatile and powerful tool, with uses limited only by your own imagination. Richard Lockton, a full-time professional Amiga user in graphics, desktop publishing and video, is going to talk us through the different sections which feature live screenshots of the programs actually running on an Amiga. Let's take a look first of all at some graphics applications. Here the image of a fish is being scanned in 24-bit colour into Art Department Professional for final sizing, scaling and colour correction. Morph Plus, also from the makers of Art Department Professional, has some additional features. Here the girl's face is loaded and one of the many image operators selected. We are going to wrap the image around a sphere. The size and shape of the sphere is adjusted with simple slider controls. When we're happy with the position, a black and white preview is selected. If we're happy with that result, a full colour image can now be rendered by first accepting the preview and then executing the image. And there's the result in full 24-bit colour for saving to disk. Now let's load another image. We'll choose the perspective operator and make the adjustments to the grid with the slider controls. Other controls are available to give further adjustment. A preview is selected. The program is seen running on an Amiga 3000 with the rendering taking place in real time. This gives you an idea of the speed of the program. Remember the preview can be aborted at any time this abort facility is useful if you don't like the look of the image and allows you to make further adjustments. We accept the preview and the new image is rendered. A further image is loading now. Let's try the ripple effect this time. The preview screen gives a representation of the ripple as a circle. Additional ripples can be added and cross interference ripples will form where they cross. The control panel can be temporarily removed to give a clear view of what is going on. The settings are accepted and the new image rendered. We've actually placed the swimmer underwater.
This time, a larger image is loaded. A picture such as this, with circular areas, is ideal to try the twirl operator. A black and white preview is shown. Here is the twirl area, which can be adjusted with the mouse or on the keyboard. I'm moving it to the bottom left hand corner, to the clock face. I could just as easily have placed it up here. I'm using the keyboard to enter the values. Accept, and the black and white image is twirled in the area I defined. Accept and execute as usual. The full colour image can now be rendered. should see it coming up now in the bottom left hand corner and we've twirled the clock face. Another powerful image processing program is Image Master. This also has many many powerful processing routines. Let's try some. I've loaded the girl's face into the primary buffer. Image Master has lots of options. Melt, lined, relief, watercolour, posterise, etc. I'm choosing Make Shine. I'll define the area first, make some adjustments, and when I'm happy with those, the results are rendered. Put a sparkle in her eye. Now back to the unaltered image. This time I'm choosing the 3D net. I define the area. I'm happy with those. I'll just alter the net spacing. The rendering takes place and the girl has a veil. Now back to the original plus a film strip. This can show you images in sequence for animations or morphing which we'll see later. This time I'm choosing the caricature effect. film strip records my original image and the color image is transformed. Imagine doing this to your family and friends. 
Now I'm doing a simple transitional morph. The two images are shown side by side and the film strip will record each frame. A true warp morph would be produced if I adjusted the red crosses over each of the original images. The picture on the right of the film strip is showing the changes now. The beauty of Image Master is you can actually see the morph taking place frame by frame. The program is doing all the work for you. I'm doing nothing at the keyboard or mouse now. Let's watch the program run. Now the morph is complete, we can view it by playing the film strip. Image Master can also warp morph to an incredibly high standard, as can ASDG's morph program, which we'll look at next. Let's morph an owl into a baby. First the project is opened and the image is chosen from our hard disk. Images can also be uh, loaded from floppies. The options screen appears, followed by the refresh image screen. I'm choosing high resolution. Now both images load. And are rendered. I can view both images at once by moving the slider halfway. The quality of a warp morph is dependent on the use of vectors to map one image to the other. I'm loading in vectors for the head and shoulders. Now I'll create vectors for the left eye. First I'll zoom in a bit.
and then move the slider to view the owl. A new vector is selected. And I'll position it just above the left eye. Make an adjustment. And now add more vectors using a keyboard shortcut. About eight or ten should be enough. Now I'll move the slider to view the image of the baby. And position the end of those vectors that I placed over the owl's eye over the top of the baby's eye. Now I can select that group of vectors together and save them. This means if I want to repeat them off, I can call those up quickly and make the adjustments without having to redraw them all. Enter the name of the vector group at the keyboard. I'm calling them left eye. Now we'll do the right eye. Exactly the same process. Choose a new vector. Position it over the right eye and adjust it. And repeat it just as before. This is done using a keyboard shortcut. Now move the slider to view the owl. And I can move the image of the owl across the screen so I get a more accurate view of it. And then adjust the, the tail end of the vectors above the owl's eye. Now select the right eye vectors as a group. and save them. The requester pops up and at the keyboard type in right eye. Back to normal size. You can see all our vectors positioned. Return to the options screen to set the number of frames over which the morph will take place. I'm going for 10 on this occasion. Uh, generally speaking, the more frames you choose, the smoother the morph is going to be. Check that we're in high resolution. And make the other adjustments that you require. Finally, I accept from the main screen and the morph will take place. Here we are viewing the result in ping pong mode in D-Paint 4. Morph also has a film strip feature called Fred, which can be used for previewing morphs in real time. Here, two logos have been morphed. And here it is in D-Paint again.
Now we'll switch to some desktop publishing applications, an area in which the Amiga is now fully supported by some excellent software. Here I'm using Art Expressions BME to trace a bitmapped logo screen. Sample rate and curve fit are adjusted. And the noise filter to exclude all stray pixels. In this case the image is black and white. And the trace takes place. and is saved as a DR2D file. I've also got the main art expression program running, so I'll import the DR2D file now as an object. Because the image is now an object, I can change the outline and the fill colors at will. We'll keep the outline as a black line, but we'll change the fill color to red. zoom in and because the image is an object we can also resize it distort it and even rotate it but it doesn't end there I can save this new version of the image once more as a DR2D file I also have PageStream running and I can import that image now into PageStream there it is and I'll quickly do a rough up of a page Define a column area for text. I'll import the text as an ASCII text file, if I can find it. There it is. And the column should fill up with text for me. Of course I could change the font or style or color at any point now. We'll add another text object though. Choose the font, the style, and the size. Doesn't really matter because I can resize it anyway when I've typed it in. Just grab the corner and drag it up. Okay, we'll change the color. And reposition it. Make it a bit wider.
Finally, I'll import the fish that you saw being scanned earlier on. The image appears in PayStream as a black and white image, but remember it will appear in full colour if you have a full colour printer. I'll resize the fish. Now at the moment, it's lying across the front of the logo, so I'll move the logo to the front. The versatile art expression program has many, many uses. I'll show you how easy it is to flow text around a shape. First we'll draw our shape. Just a simple squiggle, really. Now select the text tool. Choose the font. text will be entered as a string here. Choose the size and enter the text on the keyboard. Hit OK. The text now will appear as a blue box. There it is. can resize it. Now by selecting the line I drew earlier, choose the appropriate tool again from the menu at the top. Some options there which I can choose. And my text now flows along the line. The program asks me if I want to erase the original text, which I do, and erase the original object. So we just have the text remaining. I group those separate letters into a group, and that's it. It's just as easy to drop text into a shape. Draw the shape. Move it if I want to. Select the text tool, enter the text at the keyboard, and position my blue box again. Now select my original object, and just as before, I can make that text fit into the shape. Erase the original text and the original object. And this time we'll change the colour as well. I'll just make it a bit wider. Move that down, make gives a bit of room. Right, now we'll change the colour. as easy as that. Here all these DTP programs are being used to produce an actual full colour leaflet. Colour proofs are produced directly from the Amiga in Postscript via a Canon colour laser copier. Storage of the large files involved is handled by an external optical disk drive with each three and a half inch disc having 128 megabytes capacity. The final job is sent off to the printers in film form. These are obtained from an image setting bureau to give the final printed result seen here.
Everything here has been produced on the Amiga. Word processing on the Amiga has been revolutionized with Final Copy 2 from Softwood Incorporated, the makers of PenPal. Final Copy 2 has many of the features of a full desktop publishing package to make it more than just a word processor. It is easy to use with traditional pull-down menus and intuitive controls to help you create good-looking documents. Text may be inserted or deleted easily. and font styles and sizes quickly changed. And a text color chosen from a large range. Graphics may be added by use of the drawing tools or imported as ILBM images. The graphics can be resized and repositioned. Now I'm importing the ILBM image. Which can also be resized. A speller is included, which can be added to. and a thesaurus may be used to find the best word for a given situation. Final Copy 2 is the word processor for the Amiga with massive word processing power, spell checker, thesaurus, the ability to create and import graphics, easy document layout with style sheets and master pages. The use of outline fonts together with a postscript printer support gives superb output. Final Copy 2 gives truly professional results. Now we'll take a peek at Amiga applications in a professional broadcast standard video studio. The three machine edit suite shown here, full component throughout, uses Panasonic M2 machines, a Panasonic AG800 editing controller, Soundcraft 200 BVE 8 channel audio mixer for combining live sound, music and voiceover. And an audio sound sampler linked to the Amiga. 
The digital effects are achieved using a cell P152B touchscreen controller driving two P164 effects channels. We'll have a look at some examples. Solarization and mirror image. Some more solarization. Slow motion can be enhanced with strobe effect. Here three video channels are in use, plus the fish effect with drop shadows. Now still video is combined with a logo scanned into Art Department Professional on the Amiga. Then slow motion live action. The Flymax logo has also been used in PageStream to produce packaging and promotional material. This demonstrates the multi-talented Amiga at work. Here, a solarized still with logo again, and then to live action. The images from the Amiga are combined with video via a Genlock and Kia. Here, the G2 Systems model is used, a full component unit. The G2 mixer produces crossfades between the Amiga and video channels or the full signal may be taken from the Amiga for dumping graphics and animations to tape. The background video channel removes the Amiga from the system. The key allows the Amiga to be keyed over live or still video. The ability to key Amiga pictures over video is particularly useful for titling. B-Titler 2 software is extensively used. A large range of fonts can be chosen and sizes, together with a shadow, outline, and color. We'll enter some text on the screen. Spacing can be altered. And a range of additional effects such as underlining can be added. Line and page effects are chosen from extensive menus. And the progress of each page is shown. Here the full range of page effects is displayed. The duration and delay for each effect can be chosen. The on-screen palette allows us to alter colors at will. And there's the effect. 
against the video this time. Now we'll select a new page and enter some more text. The ability to enter text while viewing the picture is very useful. Now we'll play the full effect. We'll make an adjustment now to the second page effect and play the full sequence. To really see what this program will do, we'll have a look now at the demo. In a tape such as this, we can only give a glimpse of what the Amiga is capable of in the video studio. Remember, many of the digital effects can be reproduced using Amiga animation programs such as D-Paint and a basic Amiga. You don't need to spend a fortune to achieve superb results. This is real 3D in action. Here are animations played in Scala, showing insect life cycles. Simple animations such as these, of only a few repeated frames, can be very effective.
Here a D-paint animation is combined with ray traced water surface from real 3D. D-paint again, this time keyed over live action. And here's a D-Paint tip. This clever technique can be used to create TV style effects in creating a slideshow. In addition to a page turn, the same idea could be used to perform other reveal effects. We'll begin by selecting a color from the palette and filling the screen. Next, we'll choose a darker color from the palette and one of the larger brushes, then the curve tool. We'll drag a curve out to represent the bottom edge of the page curled up. We'll then drag the right hand edge of the page curled. Now, using the straight line tool, we'll draw the edge of the curl. We now have a simple line drawing looking like a page turn. We'll fill the back of the front page with gray. Next, we'll choose pink and fill the area that represents our second page. We'll now swap to D-Paint Spare Page, and choosing the same color we initially used, clear the screen. From the Anim menu, set number of frames to 20. Pick up the entire screen as a brush. This will give you simply a solid blue area. Choose color and pink. Bring up the line spacing requester and choose end total, making sure that its value is set to 20. Choose brush, handle, corner, so you're holding the brush by its corner. Use Alt X to select which corner you're holding it by. From the lower right hand corner of the screen to the upper right corner, Drag a line while holding the Alt key. D-Paint will then stamp the pink rectangle, gradually increasing in size from the lower right to the upper left edge of the screen. Using Shift 2, we jump to the last frame in the animation and bring up the Add Frames requester. We'll add an additional 20 frames. When we play the animation back, it looks like a pink square expanding. We'll now jump back to our picture of the curled page and pick it up as a brush. We'll use the J key to return to our animation and bring up the fill type requester. From here we'll choose brush. Turn off the menu in toolbox and point to the lower right hand corner. If we begin filling from the lower corner by holding the alt key, we see Deluxe Paint resizes our brush each time to fill the pink square. 
It will take some time for Deluxe Paint to do the entire animation. Now that completes the first half of our animation. Now to complete the animation. We'll choose Line and drag a line with our custom brush from the lower right corner to the upper left hand corner while holding the Alt key. D-Paint will drag our brush out of view. If we now play back this animation, we can see it looks like a blue page revealing a pink page. We'll now want to apply a picture to each of those colors. We'll first load a background from the art disk called Aquarium Background. Since this used a different color palette, we'll need to remap it. First, we'll restore our original palette and then choose Remap. We'll use the J key to return to our animation. From here, choose the background color to be light blue. From spare, choose merge in back and all frames. Deluxe Paint will then merge the aquarium background onto all areas that were light blue within the animation. This too could take several moments. Now to apply a picture to the pink area. We'll return to our spare page again and this time load a different background such as Venus. She too will need to be remapped. Once again choose palette, restore palette and then remap. We'll jump back to the animation and use the same technique as before. Using the 2 key, we advance a couple of frames to reveal the pink, and then select that pink as our background color. Choose Merge in Back, and select All Frames. Venus is now mapped onto the second page. When we play this animation back in ping pong fashion, it appears as if the aquarium background is being peeled off and replaced back over Venus. Try using this merge in back technique with your own pictures and wipe effects. This has been just a taste of Amiga applications and is intended to provide inspiration for those of you devoted to the Amiga. We hope this tape helps you to use your Amiga to its full potential. Remember, for actual how-to advice and instruction on particular aspects, the Amiga Video Collection library of tapes is available, all reasonably priced and crammed with tips from the professionals, all those tricks of the trade that are not to be found in the manual. Contact us at this address or phone our 24-hour hotline. The Amiga Video Collection, an invaluable instructional and informative collection of videos made by Amiga users for Amiga users. from Commodore is one of the most versatile computers currently available with applications far beyond a mere games machine, right up to professional standard in graphics, image processing, desktop publishing and video. In this video we give you a glimpse of some of the applications, software and hardware in most common use. You will see that the Amiga is a versatile and powerful tool, with uses limited only by your own imagination. Richard Lockton, a full-time professional Amiga user in graphics, desktop publishing and video, is going to talk us through the different sections which feature live screenshots of the programs actually running on an Amiga.
the Creator is nothing like you've ever seen before on the Amiga. Developed from the best-selling STOS game creation tool for the Atari ST, Amos stretches the Amiga to its limits. Whatever your knowledge of programming, Amos has something to offer you. In this brief glimpse at the program, you will see the ability to produce professional-looking games with just a fraction of the normal effort. All you need is a little imagination. Amos can be run either from floppy or hard disk and has a comprehensive manual to guide you through the hundreds of commands which are required to write sophisticated games. So it then moves to reach the other side of the plug. That's not bad. Keep trying. Whoops. 
I forgot to tell you the frog could not swim.
interface used by the Amiga is called the workbench. Think of it as a workspace for all of your in-progress projects. The workbench will allow you to view the contents of any disk, organize your programs and data, prepare new disks for data or format them, copy files from one disk to another, access programs and utilities. to the actual operations of the computer, we should explain one more function of the workbench and the Amiga. Because the Amiga is a graphical computer, there is a lot of emphasis on the screen and anything that's displayed on it. Screens are made up of several important attributes, including the resolution, referring to the number of pixels or little dots the computer can display either vertically or horizontally at once. Depending on the resolution selected, the number of usable colors will change as well. There are a variety of modes available, from 16 to 32 colors, all the way up to 4,096 colors in a specialized display mode called Hold and Modify, or HAM. Because the Amiga is graphics and video oriented, the computer will also support a video mode called Interlace. This mode doubles the number of horizontal display lines and displays half of them at a time, cycling the lines at a 30th of a second. This is the same method used by television. Now's a good time to explain some of the visual aids provided by the interactive workbench environment. Now that the workbench is loaded, you'll notice that in addition to the icons on the screen, there is an object that looks like a little arrow. This is called the mouse pointer. As you move the mouse of your Amiga, this little object will move around the screen. The mouse pointer is very powerful, as it will allow you to execute various commands without typing on the Amiga keyboard. The tip of the pointer is the actuating area of the pointer. And when you are using the pointer, make sure the tip is on top of anything that you want to use or select. The workbench screen includes several different types of objects. These include a bar across the top of the screen. Depending on its function, it's referred to as a menu bar, drag bar, or title bar. In every case, the bar will provide information to you, in addition to supporting a multiple menu system for making operational decisions and positioning the screen. More on this later. Next, there are icons. An icon is a graphical representation of either a disk, a program, a data file, or a drawer. Drawers are unique to the Amiga Workbench. They function in the same manner as the drawers of a filing cabinet. You can separate your programs or data into separate compartments. This will make keeping track of your work easy. A window represents a partition of information. For example, if you wanted to see what is on a disk, you will see a window of the information on a disk. If you wanted to open a drawer of data, the contents of the drawer will be displayed in a window. The window can provide some valuable information to you. For example, notice the colored gauge on the left side of the window. It's called a memory meter. It's kind of like a gas gauge in your car. It shows you how much room is left on the disk you're displaying. There are some other controls on the window called gadgets. We'll discuss them a bit later on. Let's take a brief look at the different types of icons available to you. First of all, there is the disk icon. This represents any disks that are loaded into the Amiga's disk drives. A disk icon could also represent a hard disk or a RAM disk. If we position the mouse on top of the disk icon and click the mouse once, it'll change color. This means the icon has been selected and it's now ready to be accessed. There are a number of ways you could do this. For now, let's click the mouse twice quickly and the disk will open up and display the window of contents on the Amiga screen. There are four types of icons now visible. The first ones to consider are the drawer icons. These look like drawers in a dresser and contain programs, data, or even other drawers of information. For example, there is a drawer with the Amiga operating system, a drawer with the Amiga utilities, another with demonstration programs, and an empty drawer, just waiting for you to put something in it. The other icons are also important. These include the trash can icon, the preferences icon, and the clock icon. If you want to erase something from the disk or from the computer's memory, you place the file or program in the trash. This is a perfect example of the interactive nature of the workbench. The preferences icon allows you to adjust the display and functionality of the Amiga. We'll discuss using it a bit later. 
Finally, the clock icon is effectively the least important one, but it can be useful. By selecting it, you can see what time it is. You can move icons anywhere you'd like on the screen. Simply position the pointer over the icon, hold the right mouse button down, and drag the mouse to the position you want the icon to be in. For example, if you want to put a program into a drawer, drag it until the icon is positioned on top of the drawer and release the mouse button. As you become more familiar with the Amiga, you'll need to begin using the Windows often. In order to learn all about Windows, double-click the mouse on top of the disk icon in the upper right corner of the Amiga screen. The window includes the memory meter, a bar across the top called a drag bar, and some controls called gadgets. A gadget is like a switch. By selecting it, a specific function will occur. Once again, this is a good demonstration of the power of the workbench. The first gadget to learn about is the clothes gadget. On a window, you can find it in the upper left-hand corner. As its name suggests, the closed gadget is used to close a window. Simply position the pointer over the closed gadget and click the left button of the mouse once. Instantly, the window will disappear. To reopen the window, simply click on its originating icon, in this case, the disk icon. In the upper right-hand corner of the window is a pair of gadgets called the back and front gadgets. These are used to position the window in the screen. If you have more than one window open, things can get confusing, so to better control the windows, you can move them around using these gadgets. Notice that the title bar at the top of the screen also has a front and back gadget. These will be used if you are multitasking, and we'll explain a bit about that a little later. In the right hand and bottom margins of the window are the scroll bar gadgets. These allow you to move the contents of the window and resize the physical size of the windows themselves. One of the first things to learn about now that we have the basics of the screen under control is disks. These fellows are the critical link between your computer and your programs and information. If you lose the information on a disk, you'll need to reassemble the data from scratch. One of the wonderful things about computers is that you can copy almost anything from one disk to another. It's a good idea to copy certain disks before you use them. That way, should something unforetold occur, you'll have a spare or a backup available for keeping your project on schedule. ImageFX is a sophisticated, full-featured image processing program. Modern image processing is the use of computer-based techniques to enhance and analyze two-dimensional images. In processing the image, the goal is to present the viewer with additional information or insight into factors that may not have been apparent in the unprocessed image. With its toolbox and palette and the scanner, render and printing modules, ImageFX delivers all the tools necessary for high-level image processing.
Typesmith has been designed with powerful drawing capabilities for professional typeface designers. It has also been made simple to use so that casual users can easily modify existing typefaces. Typesmith allows you to generate PostScript Type 1, PostScript Type 3, CompuGraphic in Telefont and SoftLogic format fonts. With Typesmith, you can create fonts for use with PageStream, Art Expression, Professional Page, Professional Draw, and any Workbench 2 compatible application.
desktop video. For many people, it's the renaissance of the video medium. Television is the most common form of communication today, and desktop video is making headlines around the world. The most exciting aspect of DTV is the merging of professional and amateur equipment and the ability for anyone with desire and creativity to access the world of television. This edition of desktop video will introduce you to a variety of equipment, techniques, and opportunities that will enhance your abilities to work in the world of video. When people discuss video, they often bring up tape formats. In the past, tape format was an important clue regarding the quality and style of a video production. If someone said they were producing a show on one inch, everyone knew it was professional. On the other hand, if they mentioned half inch, professionals assumed that it was an amateur show or just another home video. Today, almost everything you've heard about formats needs to be reevaluated. Of course, there are a few formats that are still considered top-of-the-line broadcast formats. These include D1, D2, D3, and 1-inch. These formats have tremendous costs associated with them, so only broadcast facilities currently utilize them. There are a number of other formats to consider. And these include Betacam SP, 3 quarter inch SP, Hi8, Super VHS, ED Beta, VHS, and eight millimeter. We decided to investigate tape format in order to learn about their strengths and weaknesses. We set up a photo shoot with a variety of cameras and recorders in order to capture a scene and compare the results. We recorded the same scene from the same location in order to make the comparison as accurate as possible. Further, each sequence once recorded was bumped onto Betacam SP so that the comparisons are made with a single generation loss. This sequence is Betacam SP. Most people are now using Betacam SP for professional and broadcast video production. This is 3 quarter inch SP. Typically, 3 quarter inch is used in electronic news gathering and education. It is also used for offline production work. This is high 8 footage, gathered with a 3 chip industrial camera. Hi8 began life as a consumer format, but is now finding a home in almost every form of professional video work as well. This footage is Hi8 shot with a consumer Sony camera. During the past few years, Hi8 has become the format of choice for serious home videographers. This is regular 8mm. This is the format of choice for price conscious or occasional home videographers. This is SVHS. Developed as a semi-pro format, it has fallen behind Hi8 in popularity, but is still used in cable and industrial applications as well as in consumer uses. Now, let's take a look at a direct comparison between formats. This is a Betacam SP image on the left. Now let's add a 3 quarter inch SP image on the right. Overall, they're similar but Betacam has better contrast and resolution. Now let's take a look at the same sequence with Betacam SP on the left and Hi8 on the right. Although there is a difference, it's amazing to note the overall quality of Hi8. Here are a few other variations. Take a look and judge for yourself. By the way, we didn't record in ED Beta or regular VHS, as those formats aren't widely used for most desktop video applications. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this test can be traced back to the footage when viewed independently. Is this footage Hi8? Or maybe it's SVHS. Of course, it might be Betacam SP. The point we're making is that format is difficult to distinguish without direct comparison or a highly trained eye. In our experience, we found that Hi8 is an excellent medium that relates most closely to Betacam, Hi8 footage is showing up on CNN, in music videos, and in other broadcast applications. Hi8 has improved signal-to-noise ratios over other consumer and semi-pro formats, and it utilizes an extremely high clip level, 
meaning that pictures are sharp and transfer to another reel of tape with good definition. Hyperbook provides a means to create interactive presentations to professional standard easily and flexibly. The simplest Hyperbook applications are just fancy pages that combine text and graphics. You might use the program to create Christmas and birthday cards, for example. Or, going one step further, you can store miscellaneous information on the pages of Hyperbook, locating the information you need using a built-in table of contents and search facilities in the program. Moving on from there, you can add buttons that turn to other pages, show pictures or text, or other actions. To give you a taste of Hyperbook, let's run the demo that comes complete with the program.
MIDI means Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Since its introduction, the MIDI standard has evolved from a simple multi-synth control code to a widely used sequencing and control system for a variety of applications. A MIDI program is in many ways like a computer program, although more flexible and easily modifiable. A MIDI program, called a patch, could send a simple message, such as play middle C, or it could send a complex set of instructions for a variety of instruments, sound variables, and volume control. When MIDI first came onto the scene, uh, at first, um, I, I was very inquisitive, like, what is this? And then uh, after, after that, I saw it used, I saw devices hooked up with it, and uh, even though I didn't fully understand it at the time, uh, I thought, hey, this is something that uh, can be extremely useful. You know, now we're beginning to be able to communicate uh, from device to device by different manufacturers without all these uh, little black boxes and patch cords that either worked or didn't. And, uh, you know, to me, it was just a wonderful thing. MIDI data consists of bits exactly like much of the other data that computers share. A bit can be either a one or a zero. Sending complex messages consists of combining those ones and zeros into a meaningful string. Many bits are combined into eight-bit strings or eight-bit words. MIDI requires an additional bit at the beginning of a word that says go, and a final bit at the end of a word that tells the receiving device that the word is over, so MIDI information is made up of 10-bit words. All right, uh, this particular MIDI device here has uh, your standard MIDI connections in, through, and out. Uh, now, the MIDI in is uh, simply a, uh, a plug that allows you to play your synthesizer directly into the computer. Uh, it allows the computer to actually take the information in from the synthesizer. The MIDI out is the, the reverse of that. It allows the uh, information that's been stored on the computer to now go back out and play the synthesizer. Now, the MIDI through, which is the third plug, uh, all that does is allow information pl being played from this synthesizer to come in through this uh, plug and come directly out of this plug, say, to play another synthesizer. Uh, it can be stored in the computer at the same time. Uh, it doesn't have to be. But it comes through this port, just as the term uh, denotes, through to another port without uh, being altered in, in any manner. This has been just a taste of Amiga applications and is intended to provide inspiration for those of you devoted to the Amiga. We hope this tape helps you to use your Amiga to its full potential. Remember, for actual how-to advice and instruction on particular aspects, the Amiga Video Collection Library of Tapes is available, all reasonably priced and crammed with tips from the professionals, all those tricks of the trade that are not to be found in the manual. Contact us at this address or phone our 24-hour hotline. The Amiga Video Collection, an invaluable instructional and informative collection of videos made by Amiga users for Amiga users. Son. Hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Animation. The act, process, or result of animating the condition or quality of being animate, liveliness, spirit, vitality, the art and process of preparing animated cartoons, an animated cartoon.
Nobody knows what magician first created the illusion of motion using a flip book. It's a simple idea. Draw a series of pictures, slightly changing each succeeding picture. Put them all in a stack, flip through the pile fast enough, and voila, your picture has motion. The challenge is to make the object appear to move smoothly and realistically. Contemporary animators owe a debt to a visionary 19th century photographer named Edward Maybridge, who made a detailed study of the way people and animals move. Although the study predated the invention of moving pictures, his photographs illustrate movement so clearly that when run in series, create the illusion of motion. Classical animation methods haven't changed much since then. Artists draw each picture by hand. The pictures, called cells, were recorded one frame at a time onto film. And as the film industry developed, so did animation. First talkies, and then color gave artists unprecedented freedom to indulge their imagination. And the audiences loved it. Animators, looking for another breakthrough, began using computers to create three-dimensional images, images that looked real. Armed with this new technology, their animations could create both lifelike situations and wild fantasies. Like these animations from The Mind's Eye, a computer animation Odyssey video. Unfortunately, the computers that had enough power to create such complex detailed images were quite large and very expensive. Something's happening to drink boxes. In the last 10 years, computers have become more powerful, more compact, and more economical. As a result, computers are now being used throughout the animation industry. Paint programs are replacing the classical animator's paper and ink. Computer-generated 3D graphics are dressing up film and video productions. And video images are being used as elements within animations. Because of advances in technology, personal computers have replaced the supercomputers of the 1960s, bringing animation to the desktop. And of all the PCs available, the Amiga offers the fewest impediments to realizing your creative vision. From its inception, animation has been a critical component of the Amiga, and it remains the only personal computer whose operating system includes a powerful collection of animation routines. One of the most impressive demonstrations of the machine at its 1985 launch was RoboCity, a simple but effective display that used the Amiga's built-in animation routines. And the Boing Ball so captivated the imagination, it became the de facto logo for the Amiga computer. For years, the Boing Ball was emulated by other computer systems to show that they too could be used for animation. Aegis Animator was one of the first commercial software packages of any kind available for the Amiga. This program automated the classical two-dimensional animation technique called tweening. First, the animator draws starting and ending cells of emotion. In a classical studio, lesser artists called tweeners would draw the cells in between, dividing the change equally among them. This shape-changing process is called morphing. With Aegis Animator, the computer automatically creates the intervening cells. Once finished, the animation can be played back in real time, and viewable copies can be distributed even to those who don't own the software. Soon after, a revolutionary animation appeared. Dr. Eric Graham's The Juggler. Its geometric world and mirrored spheres introduced three-dimensional ray-traced animation to the Amiga and became, much like the Boing Ball before it, a symbol of the computer and its dominance in the animation field. By this time, Amiga animation was in full swing. Animation standards had been established, letting artists use several different programs to get just the right effect in their work and software like D-Paint 3 combine 2D animation and paint programs to give artists a single package with more creative power than they ever had before.
In animation, more than any other application, choosing the right software package is absolutely vital to your success. Often, you can get similar results from a number of programs, but you'll find major differences in their user interface. And no matter how powerful the software is, if you can't learn to use it, the power it contains is out of your reach. To help find out what software is right for you, let's look at what's available in both two- and three-dimensional animation. Two-dimensional animation software is the most common and is conceptually very similar to drawing on paper. And in many ways, it's the same method used by classical animators. You draw a series of cells or frames, with each showing some degree of change. When the cells are cycled rapidly, the eye perceives movement. Two major animation packages that take this approach are the Disney Animation Studio from Walt Disney Computer Software and Deluxe Paint 4 from Electronic Arts. The Animation Studio is based upon the same techniques used by Disney's classical animators. The package is divided into two sections, the Pencil Test and Ink and Paint. These names illustrate the approach that Disney takes to animation. First, Disney animators rough out their projects without using color, as in the pencil test. Then, when they have the frames drawn and ordered as they want them, the animators move to ink and paint to add color and make finishing touches. Using the pencil test, you create black and white sketches of the animation, working out the images, storyline, and timing of the project. You will use it to draw the frames, set the series to music, and clean up the sketches before adding color. The Animation Studio was the first program to feature the onion skin technique. This feature makes the frames appear translucent, letting you see several frames at once. It's much easier to make changes in your current frame when you can see the previous frame. Once you get the hang of it, the onion skin technique and Disney's wide variety of drawing tools will help you make accurate changes faster and you'll have smoother, more professional animations. Now the real fun begins coloring your animation with ink and paint. Like the pencil test, you have a set of specialized tools. The most obvious addition is, of course, the color palette. Tools and colors are selected with your mouse and pointer. First, select the area fill tool, shaped like a paint can. Then select the color. Then click on a section of your drawing. When you're finished coloring your animation, you can further customize it by adding a background scene. Deluxe Paint 4 is the latest in a popular series of programs that combines graphics and 2D animation. With its wide assortment of drawing, painting, and animation tools, D-Paint 4 is easily the most useful Amiga graphics program available. As in Disney software, in D-Paint 4 you animate using the classical cell method. Draw a series of images, modifying each one, then cycle through them quickly to create the illusion of movement. You draw and color your images using a variety of tools controlled by the mouse. And you can use D-Paint's light table feature to view three frames simultaneously, the same way you can with the onion skin feature in Disney's Animation Studio. But the differences between the programs are as significant as their similarities. One unique D-Paint tool is the Anim Brush. Most Amiga users are familiar with the brush concept. You outline an area of the screen, pick it up, save it, and use it later as clip art. The same logic applies to animated brushes. Take an animation, select an area of the cell, and pick it. This time, the program cuts the section out of each cell in the animation, as if you were pushing a cookie cutter through the entire stack of cells. What you get is called an anim brush, a miniature version of your animation that can be pasted into other screens and animations. Then you can animate your brushes further by using some of D-Paint 4's more sophisticated features. For instance, if you want your brush to move across the screen while flipping and rotating, the Move Requester will do it for you. If instead you want one image to turn into another image, simply make brushes out of the starting and ending images. Then select Brush Morphing, and the computer will turn them into an anim brush that transforms from the first image into the second. Previous versions of Deluxe Paint supported the various Amiga screen resolutions, but they could only display 64 colors at once. Deluxe Paint 4, on the other hand, supports the hold and modify display mode, which can show over 4,000 colors on the screen simultaneously. 
With the broader color palette, you can create pictures and animations that look more lifelike with minute color variations of shadow and light. One of the most powerful 3D packages available to Amiga users is Imagine from Impulse. It's a full-featured animation and rendering program that supports 24-bit graphics and both Amiga display modes. Imagine divides the animation process into several stages, including detail, forms, cycle, stage, action, and project, each available from a pop-down menu. An additional menu gives you options to customize the program, selecting new screen colors and defining hotkeys. You typically begin by creating objects in the Detail Editor. This section lets you create easily modeled objects, such as spheres and boxes. When the shape is defined, you assign its surface characteristics, like the color, the material it's made from, what patterns cover the surface, and how reflective it is. To create objects with more detailed organic shapes, such as a face, you would use the Forms Editor, which gives you fine control over the object. The object must then be loaded into the Detail Editor to have its surface attributes defined before it can be rendered or displayed. Once your object is created, it's given motion in the Cycle Editor. There you can define its movement and attach it to other objects. The Cycle Editor is very powerful and lets you set up complex movement combinations among the various objects in your animation. To actually place the object within the scene, you need to load it into the Stage Editor. Within the Stage Editor, you place the objects, set the lights, and set the camera in a series of key cells. Define key cells for the start and end of each movement and imagine will create the frames that come between them. For fine-tuning, load up the Action Editor. With it, you can refine the elements of your animation and add special effects like explode, grow, and crumble. By this time, your animation should be about done. From the Project Editor, select the Display Mode and the Frame Resolution and start rendering. Like most 3D programs, Imagine has a steep learning curve. New users should be prepared to spend a fair amount of time learning both the program itself and the fundamentals of 3D modeling and animation. However, because of its price, speed, features, and overall power, Imagine is the single most popular 3D animation package for the Amiga. In late 1990, Newtek released its now famous Video Toaster multifunction video card for the Amiga. Along with all the video effects and other features of the toaster was an animation package called Lightwave 3D. Lightwave is a professional quality animation package, including features that were previously found only on systems costing many times more. And in spite of its immense power, Lightwave has one of the friendliest user interfaces available. Creating three-dimensional animations using Lightwave is a lot like making a movie. You build scenes that contain objects. You choose the number, kind, and location of the lights. Then you decide where the camera is and what path it will follow through the animation. Almost anything can be an object in a three-dimensional scene. Apples, dinosaurs, text logos, or even spaceships can be loaded into the 3D animation program and brought to life as an animated object. The object is actually a computer data file that mathematically describes the shape. A variety of objects come with the Lightwave software, and more are available through commercial libraries of 3D objects. If you want to create your own, you can use a 3D modeling program such as Lightwave Modeler, which comes with a Lightwave animation package. Hi, I'm Joel Hagen. I've been using Deluxe Paint through all of its incarnations. I'm going to be using Deluxe Paint 4 here to show you how to do the animated star field and the tumbling asteroid. The star field makes use of Deluxe Paint's cycle mode, and the tumbling asteroid is a great introduction to one, its one of its most powerful features, the move requester. Let's begin by creating the animated star field. I've set up my palette with all 16 of the displayable gray levels in here that we'll use for the colors of the stars. And I've also built a palette that includes the browns we'll use later in the asteroid effect. It's important to set up ranges at first that encompass these colors. Range 1 incorporates all 16 of the gray levels, and range 2 has all 8 of the browns that I built into the asteroid palette. 
The cycle mode is the trick we're going to use to create the animated stars. To demonstrate what it does, let me use the straight line tool with just a solid color here in the color mode. As you can see, that, that uh, as, as we paint a line with that color, we get what we'd expect, just a straight solid color line. If we go to the cycle mode, that same line is drawn in all 16 gray levels automatically. Now let's go one step further and click with the right mouse button on the line tool to bring up the spacing requester. We're going to select n total and set that number to be 16, which is the number of values of gray in the range we're using. Now as I draw that line, I get 16 copies of the brush placed in a straight line, each one being drawn in a sequential color in the range of grays that we're using. Let's clear the screen to the black of the sky color, stay in the cycle mode, the straight line tool, and set up a number of animation frames. I'm going to use 25 frames. I'm hitting the F10 key now to turn off the toolbox, going out to about the middle of the screen and holding down the anim painting key. Now I hit the left mouse button and drag a line out to the edge of the screen. And there you see our first star animate across 16 frames of our anim from the center toward the edge. Now I'll just keep moving down, repeating that, starting right from where the first, the first star ends up, hold down the animate, anim painting key, and stretch the line out. And you can add as many stars to your star field as you want this way. I'm going to keep going here for a little while and build up a fairly dense star field so we have some real action happening. And then we'll look at the results. All right, let's lay in one or two last stars here. Now let's turn the toolbar back on with the F10 key and see what we've done. We'll go down and play it. And there we see that nice high speed zoom effect as we crash through the star field. I'm going to turn that off by hitting the space bar and let's save that out. I'll call that one dash stars. We'll save it out and bring that back up later on after we've created the tumbling asteroid. All right, let's clear the screen now to a color that we can work against. I'm going to delete all the frames of that animation to, for the moment, all we need is just a painting screen. I'm going to go back and restore my tools to the default continuous setting here and begin by painting what will be sort of like a map of the asteroid. To start off with, I'm going to set preferences to B square. This lets a square be a square and a circle be a circle. I'm going to go back to the color mode to paint with. and. Let's choose the browns, maybe go into the fill requester, and just to save a little time, enter that second range of colors, turn random on, and let's just use one of these, this vertical contour fill here. I'm going to draw a filled rectangle holding down the shift key to constrain that to a square. Picking that up as a brush, I'm going to go to the brush menu, size, and double it horizontally to give myself a wide rectangle. It's exactly twice the dimensions of the square. Place that on the screen with the left mouse button. And now I want to begin painting the details 
of the surface of this asteroid, craters and so on in here. I want to lock the background color out using the stencil feature. By just clicking on this background turquoise color, blue color, I can prevent any of my actions, any of my painting actions from affecting that color and restrict them only to, to uh, affecting the browns that I'm using here. Let's start with a medium-sized brush and the smear mode and just break this up a little bit. We just want to give it a slightly irregular look that we can begin working with a little bit to create the look of the asteroid surface. I'm going to use the airbrush mode and continue doing that same effect. The airbrush in the smear mode just to break this all up a little bit. This will give us a nice sort of even looking surface to begin with that because of the gradient fill has already the appearance of light falling on it from above and we'll hold that right through the animation that we do. Now I'm going to switch to the shade mode and just continue in the same vein. In the shade mode, painting with one button darkens all the colors in the range that it passes over, as I'm doing up here, while the other button lightens the colors, as you see down here. Clicking the right mouse button in the airbrush tool, I can reduce the size of the spatter and actually use it more like a drawing tool. I'm still in the shade mode. At this point, I can get rid of the stencil. I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to free it to save memory. And begin using the shade mode with the airbrush to paint in some crater features various sizes. I'm going to go to the dotted line tool now and just a brush slightly larger than a single pixel. Still in the shade mode, begin touching up these shapes a little bit. Add some rays out from the craters. Just begin putting in some details to make this shape a little more interesting, a little more convincing. adding some highlights. Little touches that begin building the illusion of light falling on texture and detail. Put in a few little tiny craters here. And that should give us enough to work with to build the illusion of a, of a spinning asteroid. Now, there's one final step we need to do here. We need to make sure that we have a seamless match on this map 
between the right, le the right edge and the left edge because eventually we're going to have this map wrap completely around itself with the right edge joining the left edge. So to make sure it does that, we can use a brush and cut a slice from one edge with the right mouse button, removing it cleanly. Now we know these two edges are going to match perfectly. So if we bring this over here and carefully place it at the left edge, now, I've been very lucky here. This looks already like a seamless match. If you aren't so lucky, you can choose a brush and go back in with the smear mode or your shade tools and just soften this up a little bit. Let me go into the smear mode and just do a little bit of touch up where this line joined. If you're a little careful, you won't have much to do at this point. Now I know that this is going to match seamlessly edge to edge. There's one more step we need to do here. And that's to measure the width of this rectangle. One way to do that is to go into preferences and turn the coordinates on temporarily. And now with a single pixel brush, going back to my straight line tool and making sure I'm back on the continuous default mode here, I can draw a straight line from one end to the other. I'm going to turn the crosshairs off for a moment so that I can see what I do. The delete key toggles the crosshairs on and off. And I'm stretching a line exactly the width of the rectangle and reading that value from the coordinates at the top, 180. I'll just hit undo to undo that. And now I want to bring up the move requester while I can still remember that number. The move requester is sort of a built-in animation package of its own right within the program. I want to enter that number, 180, as an X distance in the move requester. This just means that I'm going to be moving this brush 180 pixels, or its own width. For now, I'm going to exit, and it will remember that number. Now I need to pick this up as a brush, clear the screen, and set a number of frames. We'll set 25 frames again to equal the number of frames that we set up for our star field. Stamp the brush down once with the left mouse button on the first frame and undo. Now the computer knows where that brush was and we don't need to look at it anymore. Bringing the move requester up again, we already have our distance entered here and we can preview what it's going to do. It should move that map cleanly across the screen to the right, 180 pixels. When we're satisfied that it's doing that properly, we can draw. And that'll complete the first phase of what we need to do. We need this map to have a second copy of itself follow the first across the screen. Go up to brush handle and set it to corner so that you can move this map right over and place it next to itself precisely. And now you see why we needed that to be a seamless match. I'm hitting undo again and going back to the move requester. A quick preview to verify that it's following itself. And let's draw that. Now the entire landscape of this asteroid is streaming past the frame. If I hit the number four key, we can see what it's doing. Play it as a looping animation. I'm going to stop that. And let's do an anim brush pickup now. This is just like cutting a brush, but it's going to cut a brush from all the frames of the animation. It's important here to be very precise about positioning that brush exactly over the map itself without the crosshairs going out into the background at all. And you notice I'm cutting out just about exactly a square, one half. Of the map that we cut. Now, as I paint this around the screen, we can verify that that map is streaming by underneath the anim brush. 
Let's clear all the frames. Now we need to place this map onto a spinning asteroid. Let's go back with the right mouse button to the fill tool and go back to a solid fill. And I'm just going to choose a color that I can see clearly and the filled freehand line tool. Now I'm just drawing a rough irregular shape to represent that asteroid. I'm going to pick this up as a brush, place it down in the screen, and undo. Once again, let's go back to the move requester, clear all of our previous settings, and this time we just want to spin that. So I'm entering 360 degrees on the z-axis. Previewing that, we'll see that it just spins like looking down on top of a phonograph record. Let's draw that. And this is going to add to the illusion of a tumbling object in space now, as we have this basic shape spinning in one direction while the map flows by in another. We can take a look at that by hitting the 4 key to play this. And there you see the tumbling effect as it spins. Now let's fill it so that we have something that looks like an asteroid. So I'm going to go to Anim Brush, Use, so that we know we're using our Anim Brush. Right mouse button in the Fill tool, and this time we're going to use the Wrap. And this gives the illusion of wrapping whatever brush you use, including an Anim Brush, onto a three-dimensional surface. Holding down the Anim Painting key now, I'm clicking the left mouse button to begin using the Anim Brush to fill this shape. And it automatically goes through each frame of the animation advancing the anim brush one cell at a time to fill this shape. So now we're combining two separate movements, the spinning rotation with the anim brush sweeping by horizontally. Let's play that now with a four key. And there we get the effect of a tumbling asteroid in space. You can adjust the speed with the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard. Once we're satisfied with that, let's in turn pick this up as an anim brush, using anim brush pickup, making sure that I make a brush big enough to get around the entire tumbling surface. And we'll place this into our star field animation. So I'm reloading the stars that we made. And both of these animations share the same palette. And there are a number of ways that we could place this into the animation. Let's use the move requester to do it. So going back to move, we'll clear all the settings again. Make sure that we place this anim brush down in the middle here. Undo. And now we're not going to enter any movement settings at all. We just want that animation to be laid down right in the same place. We preview it just as a precaution and then draw it. Now each frame of the anim brush pops right into the middle of the screen as though we're following this hurtling asteroid through space. Let's hit the four key and see what it looks like. So there we have it. Pretty quick technique that gives you a, a nice visual reward without much work. Hi, I'm Lou Wallace, senior editor at Amiga World Magazine. I'm going to demonstrate LightWave 3D 
which is a 3D modeling and animation package that's included with the Video Toaster software. We're going to be looking at release 2.0 of the Video Toaster package, which has all the latest features and functions of LightWave. For the demonstration, I'm going to create a chessboard and revolve a camera around the chessboard and the chessman. To do so, I'm using a, a library of pre-existing objects, the chessboard and the chessman, and I'm not going to create them within the existing modeler package. Now, I could do this, or if I was talented enough, and obviously uh, you could do it if you're talented enough, but to, for the sake of brevity for this demonstration, I'm going to use existing models. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do, this is essentially a walkthrough, um, a guided tour perhaps of LightWave, but it's going to be a quick one. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to try and explain as much as I can, but there are going to be some things that I just don't have time to explain or I'm going to assume that you already know. If you get a little confused, I suggest you go back and watch the demo again. And if you have access to LightWave, perhaps walk through the demonstration, reproducing some of the things that I do. Uh, and I think it'll become a lot more clear. So let's get started and create an animation. So the first thing we need to do is load up some objects. Now, going to the object menu and selecting load object, it gives me a list of all the various directories in the object directory. And I'm going to choose the chess uh, directory. The first thing I want is a chessboard. Now these are from the Amiga World Library, so they've been converted from Turbo Silver objects over to Sculpt, and then LightWave will load Sculpt images and objects. We've got the chessboard, and one by one I'm going to load all the various pieces. And this is the black bishop. You notice the points in the polygon number increases with every object that I, that I load. Depending on the amount of memory you have, you can only load you know, so many objects. But we have plenty of, of storage or current capacity left, so we can get everything in we need. Let's get the Black King. The Black Knight. And the White Queen. Now we've now loaded the entire set of, of um, chessmen that we're going to use, as well as the chess board. The first thing we need to do is to go to the layout menu and start positioning these. And I'm going to zoom in a lot because I want to have a lot of detail and I'm going to change my grid size which is the fold is 1000 down to 100 zoom back out a bit okay now the first thing I need to do, need to do is go to the object edit option and when I select object Whatever is in here, whatever item is selected here, in this case it's the chessboard, will be highlighted. See how it's a brighter white uh, rectangle. Now that we want to make everything level with the top of this, so I'm going to cycle through these. First I'm selecting the black bishop. And I want to constrain the movement to along just the Y axis. I don't want to move along the X and Z yet. So I've turned those off and I'm only moving on the Y axis. So by holding down the mouse button I'm able to very carefully move it. And notice how I lined up the black bishop right along with the top of the chessboard. Now let's do the next one, the black castle. We'll move that down. Now we're not, we haven't started the horizontal positioning yet, but we got to get everything lined up for the top. There, now we're back to the chessboard. What I want to do now is I want to create a keyframe and I want to lock all of these into position so they won't move off their Y axis. So I, I select create key and I want to do all items. So I click on OK. Now everything is locked in here. I'm going to go back to the top down view and zoom out a bit so I can see all of my chessboard and center it here on the screen. OK. And fill it up just a little. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to move these objects into the various squares that I want them to be on the chessboard. Uh, to do that, I only need to move them in the X and Y axis, not in the Y, because we've already set that. So I'm going to turn on X and Y, and I don't want to move the chessboard, I want to move the object. So I'm going to go to the first object, which is the bishop. Now I'm going to move that over to one of these squares. Now since I can't see them right now, if I wait a little while, they'll all become visible, but the moment I move anything, it goes back to the simple rectangles, which makes things uh, work a little smoother. Uh, I'm going to move it to an approximation of where I think that square is. 
and then release it. Then, if I wait a few seconds and take my hand off the mouse and the mouse button, the computer will calculate all the new positions and all the vectors here, and it'll show me all the lines of the objects. And we'll be able then to define, see how closely I am to the square. And that should be coming up here in just a second. There it is. So you see I'm off a little bit. I need to move it over just a little, so I'm going to grab it again and move it over just a little more. I think that's about right. So I'm going to go to the next one, which is a castle. And I'll move the castle up to about here. Okay, now I've got everything more or less positioned the way I want them. So the next thing I need to do is I need to lock everything in place because I've got all these objects positioned here more or less in the center of the, of the squares that I want them. I've got them lined up along the top of the chessboard, so everything's fine. I want to make sure they don't move. So again, I'm going to go back to Create Key. And only this time I'm going to say Select All Items. And uh, click on OK. Now all of these are locked into place. They're all positioned here and they're not going to move. The next thing I need to do is set my camera. So let's go to camera view and let's choose camera. Now we can move the camera in and out by simply, let's it, just work on the z-axis which is into to the, to, to the depth of uh, the dimension of the mon monitor. And by moving the mouse I can move the camera back and forward f closer or further away from the objects. Let's put it right about here and, and raise it up just a little bit. Now I want to rotate it down so it's going to look down at the chessboard and perhaps move it in a bit more. Okay. Let's lock the camera in place. Let's create a key just for that camera. Selected item. Now, I want to rotate the camera around this, looking down at the chessboard. I could go around and I could move the, the, the camera to different positions and create different keys for it, but there's an easier way of doing it. So let's exit the layout and go back to the object menu, and let's load another object. This time, let's load something called a null object. A null object is an object supplied with light wave. It's a single point. It doesn't really have any shape. It's just a point, a mathematical point. But we can do some interesting things but with the use of a null object. Now we've got it loaded. Notice it's just one point. We go to the layout menu and just look straight down and zoom in just a bit. Okay? And I'm going to go back to object and I want to choose the null object. And so we've got null object chosen. If you look carefully right here, the very center of the screen, you can see a little white dot. That's just the, the position of the null object. It's not anything that's really visible once we animate, but it's there. You see, here it is, right at the, uh, at the center of the board. Now what I want to do, going back to camera view here, what I want to do is I want to lock the camera to this null object so that the parent for the, for the camera will be, let's go to the camera, the parent will be the null object. Okay, the, so now the, the, the camera is locked to the null object. Whatever we do to the null object, well, the camera will respond to. So let's go to frame 180. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to go to the null object and I want to rotate that but so that by the time it get, we get to frame 180, I want it to have rotated 360 degrees on its axis. So I'm entering 360. So as you can see, in frame 180, the null object will have rotated 360 degrees. Let's create a key for that object. Now let's go back to frame zero. Now, now we've got 180 frames here, which means that the null object is going to rotate two degrees per frame. Let's go back to the layout menu, to the scene menu, and let's say the last frame will be 180. Okay. Go back to the layout menu. And let's create a preview of this. I want to go make preview, and I want to do it with a bounding box. And bounding boxes are these square rectangles, where, which are drawn a lot quicker than actually rendering the wireframe of the objects. So we're going to do a preview of the animation using bounding boxes. Now notice, you see it's drawing. Look at the frame change over here. And it's drawing each one of these, so we're seeing the position. And what we're seeing here is what the camera is doing. The little null object in the center of the, of the display is rotating. The camera is locked to that, so the camera is rotating with the null object. Now we're ready to render. Let's go ahead and render just one frame so we can take a look at the scene and see what it looks like. 
So I'll set it up on manual and I'll click go. As Lightwave renders on your Amiga screen, you will see a grayscale representation of the image that's being rendered. This is not the true image, it's merely a representation. And depending on the complexity of the scene, it'll take a while to render. Now, as we can see, this looks pretty good. The image is fine. Obviously, we're in low resolution mode, but otherwise it looks pretty good. So now let's go back to the Video Toaster uh, Lightwave screen. And while well, we're all set to go, let's uh, set it up for record mode. We turn on record. Since we're going to be using the Nucleus single frame controller, the record command is T pound sign. That's already there and we're ready to go. Uh, just quickly checking over everything. We've got 180 frames. Got all of our objects, surfaces, the images, the lights, the camera, everything's fine. We're in low resolution. Backdrop is fine, set up for black. Record is on. Now all we gotta do is just say render. This time we switch it to automatic. And then we cl when we click on OK, it will begin the job of rendering each frame, frame of the 180 frames, dumping each frame to tape, and then tomorrow when we run it again, we'll have uh, a six second animation. So here we go. Now, as you can see, it looks really very nice. While it was done in low resolution, uh, the motion smooths everything out. You've got a nice six second loop. It looks good. And it gives you a good idea of what you could do with Lightwave. By adding more frames, for example, going to 360 frames instead of 180, we would have got even smoother motion. By upping the resolution, adding shadowing and reflection, we could have got an even more photorealistic animation. But this will give us a good idea of what we can do. So there you have it, the basics of animating on the Amiga. Now it's off to Computers R.S. to buy software. But how do you decide which one to buy? Well, when you've figured out how much time and money you want to invest, you can move on to the important question. Is it love? Imagine that you had created the animations you saw today. Which one made you gasp? Which program looked like fun? Without a doubt, if one of them inspired you, if the program made you want to dig in and get started, then it's the right one. As in any romance, you need to find a mate that can understand the way you think. For instance, if you draw and sketch, try Disney's Animation Studio. If you think in color and want pixel-by-pixel -pixel control, try D-Paint. If you talk in angles and parameters but can't draw to save your life, Imagine will probably feel right to you. There are a lot of animation packages out there. Visit your software dealer and try a few of them out. Chances are if you find an animation that you love and a program makes sense, then you've found a match. With an Amiga and some passion, there's very little you can't accomplish.